for the organizers who to give me a chance here to to be talking to you and it has been a pretty exciting week a lot of chatting cookies coffees i barely can sleep <laughs> And today I'm going to be talking about this problem, right? This is actually a three-body perspective of these quench experiments, right? That people are starting investigating and uh, unitary Bose gas is something that is coming back, right? It was tried in the past, but now uh, it's coming back. It's a pretty fundamental problem. And so here are some of the people that uh, mo uh, Phil Dan I think most of them are uh, directly involved in, in on the things that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to expand a little bit uh, this direction here. And um, a lot of the, the, the funding coming from NSF, also from the Air Force. Uh, sorry, from the, yeah, the Air Force. And I guess I don't need to uh, motivate much the people in this room, right? Perhaps it's just a, a kind of big picture, right? What the theory, to my view, has been able to accomplish. I think in the early stages, right, it was really trying to look for signatures of f physics in cold gases, tracing a uh, few in more bodies, new class of uh, universal states, is, they are all around. So few body physics is really expanding, right? And that's and also approaching to a more quantitative level, right, where the theory now can actually uh, uh, talk with experimentalists in a more realistic way, right? But of course, all this is possible because of the strong connection of universal field body physics to ultra cold systems, right? They, they have very clean, accurate experiments, they can control the interaction, something that we do change in one number. They have, it's a little bit more complicated, of course experimentally and so on, they can directly probe the regime where the theory uh, works best, right? And that's my view, right? It's a, it's a door for a new uh, research venue, right? Now, maybe before I get to the physics that I wanna talk about today, I just wanna walk through how we think, I'll walk you guys how to, and show how we think this few body problems, right? Maybe. Uh, of course, a lot of people here have a good idea of how we do it, but just in case, right, we like to think of any particle problem, right, where you normally would write the Hamiltonian this way, and if you want to in spherical coordinates, right, it would have a bunch of angles and a bunch of interatomic distance. What we like to do is transform this Hamiltonian to hyperspherical coordinates, right? In that way, we have just a single length distance, uh, sorry, a single uh, length scale. In all other degrees of freedom, they go, uh, there's the angular kinetic energy and the interaction, right? So it's semi-separable, right? The interaction uh, make it uh, almost separable. So the R here is the hyperradius, give the overall size of the system and all the, the, the angles, right? They describe the internal motion, we call it the hyperangles. Right. We, we like to use for three particles and sometimes for four particles uh, what we call the democratic hyperangles. Right. They are nicer because they uh, help us in treating fragmentation channels. Right. The symmetrization of wave functions is easier in using those uh, uh, kind of coordinates. But overall, right, we, we do an adiabatic expansion. We get the total wave function, assume there is a quasi-separability -separ here, and throw this back to the Hamiltonian and derive uh, hyper uh, I, I, what we call the adiabatic equation. We are solving this for fixed values of hyperradius, and the eigenstates are the effective potentials that we all have at least a good idea of what they, they could describe, right? We just need to keep in mind that now, in this axis, we have the hyper radius, so it describes the overall system. But looking to the asymptote, you can uh, see uh, channels here describing collision between three three particles, but you also, the ones that are bound here, there are channels describing a diatomic state colliding with a free atom, right? And of course, we can look to the spectrum 
right, in these potentials, right, and determine uh, whatever is below this, the lowest level, those are actual bound states, and above here, those are resonant states, right? So it's the same idea that you, you have when looking to two-body potentials, right? It's a very intuitive picture. You just need to solve the, the hyperradial equation, right? Those are typical values, right? We need to be able to describe non debat corrections and so on, typical length scales, right? Our 100 bar temperatures of uh, 100 nanokelvin, and that implies in solving this equation to very large distances, right? Which is uh, something funny, if you think. Okay. What? The lambda squared you had there in the hyperspherical one. So that's like an analog to when I solve the Schrodinger equation in spherical coordinates, I get this L squared term? Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the hyperangular angular momentum, okay. right? The solutions of this part are the hyperspherical harmonics, okay. right? It's no different. So it's a very intuitive thing. It's a, it's a ex well, natural extension. Right out, it doesn't commute with Hamiltonian, so um, yeah. it's, it's not like in 3D where you can just replace it by R plus one. Okay. Yeah, this time the interaction couples. The interaction depends on the hyper angles, right? Is that what you? You, mean? you mentioned your hyperspherical harmonics, but that means those are solutions in the absence of the interaction. Their solution of this Would part of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Yeah. Those are eigenstates of this operator, but not, of course, eigenstate of the whole Hamiltonian, right? And that comes the problem in using hyperspheric harmonics expansions, right? Because they have to do diagonalize this part, right? Which is a complicated story. So that's more or less the, the, the overall picture of how we think the problem. So it, we are always looking for ways to calculate these potentials. A lot of the work we do is to solve the angular equations, but once we have that, right, it's uh, straightforward to do the scattering part for most of it, right? And so, at least in this first part of my talk, what I want to start discussing is unitary quantum gases, right? Which means uh, the case in uh, you have a system where the scattering between the particles is much larger than the typical interatomic distance, right? The average interatomic distance in the, in the system. And <coughs> of course, uh, even though both gases, they, they were achieved first, right? Fermi gases were the first one that uh, people were able to study the unitarity regime, right? And of course, there's a lot of development there. A lot of groups have been observing and studying, and they found a, what they call a stable universal state, right? Which means it depends mostly in that case, right? Because this scattering uh, is not a relevant uh, length scale in the system, right? It depends mostly on the, the interatomic, uh, the densities and so on. It's a, a stable, uh, instable system, right? And the reason that it's stable, right, is that for Fermi gases, losses are reduced, right? One of the, the problems is true body recombination, right? You have these three free atoms colliding to form a diatomic state in a free atom, and that releases kinetic energy that can make both products to, to escape from the trap. In the case of fermions, right, the body recombination uh, is proportional to the temperature, right? Which means for low enough temperatures, this is important. For bosonic systems, what you have is that this is constant even at zero temperature, right? And it has also a very strong scale, scaling with the scapula. And that implies in what? That the time scale for losses in Fermi gases, they are much larger than the time scale for many body physics, right? So that allows the system to equilib equilibrate. For, for, uh, for both gases, that's essentially the opposite, right? Losses, they would be uh, just too fast to see any sort of uh, field body, uh, many body physics. The system wouldn't equilibrate in that regime. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, what, what, did, what did I say wrong that everyone is. Is 
just for unitary unitary regime, I would expect they have some some more natural dependence on what. I mean, if you look at this formula for fermions, sure. you would imagine. Okay, so this, sure, th th those are the rates not at unitarity, right? But you have to get there, right? So to get there, you have to beat this kind of time scales, which are very long, and for bosons, you have to beat this scaling. So if you go from small scatterland and to to infinite scatterland, you're gonna have to 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 face this sort of scaling. All right, so perhaps before you get there, mm -hmm. right, you, your system is gone. All right. But I, I will show the, the, the key thing is to calculate these losses at unitarity, and that's one of the, the, the points of this work. Right. How do you understand the losses at unitarity? Uh -huh. Yes. And this fermionic system, these two component fermions. So as A goes to infinity, would it gap at replacing A by the equal equation? Um, we did we did similar stuff, right? We tried a few things, and uh, again, that that's that's. The rule of thumb I can, one can use. Well, you could use instead the Fermi energy, yeah, right? So the Fermi But you're going to have to look for another energy scale, another length scales, which are not the scattering anymore because the scattering diverts. And for right? bosons also, the Fermi wave number expressed like that as a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess related to this, um, how do you define your many body time scale? I don't, but they are typically longer, right? This is just a. Uh, <laughs> I did, well, you could define the, let's say. I mean, do, would we do it through the Fermi momentum, and then for bosons, it would be the equivalent of the Fermi momentum? I think that, that that's a reasonable estimation, right? At least for the order of magnitude, right? Uh, I don't know what is happening here. There is overlap, uh, overlapping slides. Oh. But at unitarity? Well, I don't see why it's not. That's the only, that's the low energy edge to attract you by excitation. So I think that's the only relevant time scale. OK. But you, you will f quickly uh, see that all this time scale, you, you can think they are much longer than the time scale for losses. OK? <coughs> so well, damn it. Oh, I said it. <laughs> so behind all the um, all this scaling, the scattering independence, and so on, well, what we have is something more fundamental, right? That uh, that can explain this lossy behavior, right? Uh, and that that is the FMO of physics, right? And of course, that was predicted in the nuclear physics context, right? Here or not here, but strong collect connected to here. And the idea is that for fermions, when you have large scatterland, the interactions become repulsive. So they, try, they, they tend to pull away the atoms. Right? And that prevents them to, to get very close to each other. And because when they get very close is when in the last transition happens and losses happen. Right? So that implies for fermion, fermionic systems, long lifetimes. For bosonic systems, uh, the interaction is predicted to be attractive. So that allows the particle to get close to each other. And that, again, you imply in short lifetimes. But also implies in a lot of interesting stuff, right? which uh, is known as the FMOV effect, which is the formation of an infinity number of three-body bound states. So Hmm? Unitary fermions can attract each other, right? What do you mean by repulsive? Unitary. Well, the, the, the three body interaction is repulsive. Consider the, a, the uh, adiabatic potential curve, I don't know how to use it. Okay, okay. So it's not the 
two body interactions. It's no, no, it's the, it's the three body. In your radial equation. Yes, yeah. Okay. And, okay, this is just a, a figure. So I'm calculating this F mob states as you change the scatter line. Right, those the different colors here are different pot uh, two-body potential models. Right, essentially those are Leonard Jones uh, potential models, but with a different number of deeply bound states. Right, and you can clearly see right, there's a very strong universality, and that's connected to what Chris said on Monday, right, the universality of the three-body parameter. But well, you can see I'm calculating here just three of them. Right, it is the the color ones. They have a what could be a error bar, but this is just essentially the, the, the actual width, because they, they can decay, right? And well, as you're so as you're turning, changing the scattering, these states are appearing and disappearing. So scattering observables should uh, show this kind of uh, uh, signatures, right? You change the number of, b number of bound states, some scattering observable is gonna show a resonance there, right? In this case, three-body recombination, uh, this is what one calculation we did uh, some time ago for cesium atoms. Right? <coughs> the different curves in the same color, they are different temperatures. So we start with 600 nanokelvin, few nanokelvin, and get very, very low. And you clearly can see the, the A to the 4 power law. This is the region of uh, negative scattering. So you see F mode resonances, and you see interference in a positive side, which is also a consequence of FMOV physics. Here, the different colors, they mean uh, recombination to a different final state. Okay, that is the, but they all otherwise follows this A to the fourth power law. How do you introduce temperature? Hmm? How do you introduce temperature? I calculate the energy. Uh, the recombination has a function of energy, and then I take a thermal average, assuming a Bose distribution for uh, Boltzmann distribution for the energies. So for the first step, you solve the few body problem, right? Yeah, for various energies and so on, and then when I want to think about a gas, I take a Boltzmann distribution of energies and do a thermal average. Okay. So I guess the key thing here is that. You can see if you, whether you start from small and positive or uh, small and negative, get to unitarity implies uh, a strong enhancement of the, the three body losses. Of course, that does not diverge. Right? So, this power law, a to the four, is only valid up to some critical value that we know what it is. This is when the, temp the, the scatterland becomes comparable to the De Broglie wavelength. Uh, that's when the rate starts saturating. So at neutrality, you're going to have some uh, constant value for the rate. Right? It's finite. The losses are finite at neutrality. But and the water lens is scared of the gravitational forces coming to uh, becoming important. Gravitational forces. Yeah, because eventually you have a one of our potential. Uh huh. So I think what we have to. Uh, well, I guess before that happened, you already exceed the size of your trap. Right, and I'm not sure if that's size really relevant. Size of trap can be made uh, arbitrarily large, but uh, it's not easy to reduce the scale <coughs> of gravitation. Well, I, I do know the, the gra uh, gravity does affect experiments, mm -hmm. right? Because but typically, gravity between the atoms. So, um, I, I think that should be tiny, tiny. That in every elastic scattering cross section in nature is infinite. So that, that's a characteristic <laughs> lambda scale. I believe that the practice comes into play. So I wonder if it's uh, well above ten to the six power. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I guess the bottom line here is that the recombination is finite. Right? This does not diverge at unitarity, but it's still finite to a pretty high value. Right? 
you this, this formula here was uh, this, the formula in this exact form was derived in this work, right? But we had the same kind of uh, ideas, but without this term here. Eta is the inelasticity parameter. That's the nice thing of this formula, right? That uh, it can uh, give you some connection to the physics of the resonance. Eta, or you can parameterize in terms of the probability of decaying system. This is not a universal parameter, right? So if I The t this term in parentheses, okay. right? We assume that when we call unitarity limit, right, is the maximum value, and the maximum value is when this guy is one, right? Now this work is introducing this because it might not be one, right? It might be slightly smaller, but never can uh, can exceed this value, the value without this term. So this formula is applicable when, is applicable when t is much higher than t n. Much higher than for meter. Um, well, it really it's valid when this happens. We're K here, uh, okay. K is the uh, the inverse of the. It's related with the temperature, mm -hmm. right? When A is much larger than the De Broglie wavelength, is mm -hmm. when this. Do you require the temperature to be higher than the temperature? It doesn't, it doesn't, so I can Otherwise have very... Otherwise, would diverge at t equal to zero? Yes. Uh, so do you Usually, unitary limits do diverge. Yeah. Uh, so for this to be quantitatively accurate, I wonder if you require t to be much higher than the temperature. Right. Well, this is like an upper bound, right? It's, it's a unitary limit. If every reaction causes a recombination of every scattering event. OK. But if you don't want to think on the many body parts, just think in three particles. OK. Let's st go step by step. We're going to get to the more particles. But so far, that is just a saying that uh, when the scattering is very large, larger than the De Broglie wavelength for these particles, right? It saturates in this form, right? And you can see this happening here, right? Has increased the decreased the temperature, the rate here increase, and so on. Okay, so in order to to estimate, to put some actual numbers there, right? I got the numbers <coughs> for the rubidium eighty five experiment where Ada was found to be 0 0.06, and if I plug the masses and use the the typical a typical peak density. You can estimate a lifetime of about uh, 0.4 microseconds. Right? So that's very short. Right? You can't do what much with that. Was that. That was the temp. Well, probably 10 nanokelvin, which is at least the, the, the temperature where the rubidium experiment has been using. Yeah, you can. Uh, what the rubidium experiment, experiment did was to to find the, uh, this first resonance, right? And the width and the height of this can be associated with the eta parameter. You can use universal formulas to fit that and then extract the value of eta, right? And I'm using that value because that value shouldn't change when you go change the scattering, right? And I'm using that value to calculate that number. Okay. So yeah, that's not good news. That, that, those are those aren't good news. Right? If you look through body recombination and you want to approach unitarity by uh, is uh, going from small to large, you're gonna face this time scales for losses. And those are two experiments, right, that have been uh, studying the stability of both gases or all their properties, right? I think this work, they found some interesting signatures of four body uh, contributions for the losses and so on, but they are both lossy, right? 
and still not quite into the unitarity regime, right? Uh, the scattering wasn't large enough, okay? Essentially because it's very hard to get there, right? And that's actually uh, where this new experiment in Gila, uh, they found a way to get around to some of some of these problems. What they are doing, uh, they are quenching the interactions, right? They're using this word quench. Right? They start with the system at some positive and small scatterland, so it's basically no interacting. They start with a BC and quickly change the magnetic field on top of the resonance. So the gas does become uh, strong and interacting, right? And well, there's a lot of things that were found in, in doing this, right? They found a lot of non equilibrium dynamics, right? Now, the problem, the quench introduced a lot of new physics, right? And the, it's a quite an interesting problem for, from the theoretical point of view. Uh, they, they do find uh, a metastable state, right? Uh, there's some dynamics they observe, look into the tail of the momentum distribution there. Uh, the idea is try to, to, to understand the uh, uh, tense contact interaction over there right, in this unitary regime, but it's dynamic, things change with time. Right? And of course, it opens a way, it demonstrates one way to approach unitarity. And the key ingredient, to my view, in this experiment is that they found uh, a lifetime of about 0.6 milliseconds. And that was really puzzling, right? Because that's what they were showing. And then so far, I have been, everything that I've been saying is showed exactly the opposite. Right? And so that g hooked me up in this problem, try to understand what was going on. And well, there's an avalanche of theory work coming on. Right? Some of them, the, 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 uh, disagree. They have so it's it's really an initial uh, exploration, right? So hopefully some more people here are gonna get into this problem and throw more information. Uh, but for this short time scale, uh, when this since these things are density dependent blocks, so you lose atoms from the densest part of your obtain track, and so the equivalent density keeps dropping very quickly. And effective temperature goes up again. But, uh, so in such short time scale, could, is it possible to uh, really tell that this is the light? What is short time for you? Point millisecond? Uh, less than a millisecond is very short. Yeah, so uh, the, the thing is that they didn't see losses. The losses, they started being important passing that time, point, point millisecond. So, uh, that the losses didn't affect, my, I mean, it's hard to talk about the temperature. Uh, I don't think they, they, well, they, they, they saw losses with this lifetime, lifetime but the, the dynamics he, I think Jose is going to show was on tens of milli microseconds sort of time scale, far, far faster than, than this than number of loss. So, yeah, and really what I'm going to talk is about our work, right? And actually, I'm going to be very specific because this work here described uh, both the two body, the many body, and the three body. Right. I just want to talk about our three body perspective of this problem. Try to see to show you how we understand the losses. Right. This is a very rich uh, uh, problem. This could be another talk. Right. If you want, but I'm going to try to keep things realistic. Right. So I have just a finite amount of time. Uh, our first uh, thing, uh, the first thing we try to understand, right, because that's what we expect, 0.4 microseconds, right, was to look to, to the problem in a different way, right? If we have actual uh, unitary gas. So temperature might not be more impo important anymore, but the Fermi energy might be important, might be the, the, the relevant uh, energy scale, right, for, for unitary gas. And you can associate that with the density. The density is position dependent. So I calculate an average recombination that depends on the density, right? So essentially, what I'm doing is 
plugging, uh, substituting energy in this formula by the Fermi energy, in doing these integrals, and get a new expression for uh, recombination. Okay, that now involves the peak density. Uh, I'm assuming a uh, Thomas Fermi uh, density profile. And when I plug some numbers here relevant for Ruby 87, 85, what I get is 0.2 milliseconds, right? As opposed to the 0.4, right? So basically, there's three orders magnitude improvement. If you think so, that was an indication that perhaps uh, um, the temperature did you do? ten nanokelvin, the initial temperature of the gas. Oh, you, you, you can definitely uh, define a Fermi energy for a Bose gas, right? Uh, originally, you have a dependence on the spin. You put an integer spin in that formula, and that how you do it. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's the inverse of the average separation of the atoms. Yeah. But, you, but a lot of people call that a Fermi wave number, even for a Bose gas. Okay, and that's uh, why that matters. Because there's no Fermi statistics. And, uh, the, the, this does not depend on Fermi statistics. It's like it's Chris the said. It's the, definition. Yeah. it's the characteristic energies. Energy scale for this and then. Uh, it's, it's not everything that Fermi did is for fermions, right? <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Can you say again what you're using? Fermi pseudo potentials. What you're using? Uh, the Thomas Fermi. That's the, the, the at least that is the initial density for the gas. Oh, okay, so you use the initial density because yeah. the time scale is so short. Is yeah, exactly. Scale. I just want to look the times there are uh, just after the quench. Mm -hmm. So at t equals zero, what? Here, yeah. uh, I I had to to derive this f for you, right? I mean, uh, th there is some reasoning. There is there are some approximations, but that's very close to how experimentalists think. Right? So it's really not a, a an ambiguous way to define an average rate. And, and saying it's because it's a three-body thing is too obvious, right? I mean that you. Yeah. Hmm. I'm just trying to understand, is the cube just because, I mean, this is, a, I'm sorry, is this a three-body recombination loss rate? L3, yes. But one thing I'm a bit confused about is uh, the, the loss rate, uh, because of strong correlation, strong large scattering, the, the loss rate uh, should, should not scale like a density cube, should behave like other power laws. I think Eric, Eric Braden, in his paper, he has a different power law for the, for the three-body contact density. Mm -hmm. And then the rate is, uh, is proportional to a three body contact density. So it has a different power law than any, any field. Yeah, I mean, you, you can see here, right? Uh, but your T is the same across the trap. Right? Yes. Across the class. Yeah. yeah. But, they have the, but the Fermi energy is not. You know, the, the key thing, this is just a hand-waving way to get a number out of this, right? We are testing the idea of uh, uh, that local properties, right? That Fermi energy might be more relevant than the actual temperature. If I use the 10 nanokelvin this, I get what? 0.4 microsecond. But if I use the Fermi energy, I get 0.2 milliseconds. So it, it's an indication, right, that local properties are important. I think if you use the Fermi temperature for the temperature, then you would have the same power law dependence on density as the uh, uh, So you will see the density dependence that I get as a function of density, okay? But I, I definitely, you know, <laughs> if you think deeper, right, <coughs> why would you be using, uh, uh, this, uh, because this formula relies on the concept of scattering. Right? But in a unitary gas, 
Uh, it's hard to talk about scattering because the particles were never free, right? So you, they were never uh, no interacting. They were always interacting and so on. And that's this form, kind of formula assumes that the particles at some point are not interacting. So there's a, a lot of uh, question marks in using this approach, right? And also this approach does not bring any information about FMOV states. Right, which we know that at unitary it should be the best place to look for FMOV physics. Right. So this is just an a, a, a indication right, of what, are, what possibly can be happening in the problem because they do observe lo uh, lower lo uh, losses, right, longer lifetimes. So what we did right, uh, we cannot solve the many body problem, okay? Sorry, you made a comment that the formula assumes that the particles are, are it's you know, that you have a synthetic state, mm -hmm. like you said. So they, in driving that, so what does it make it a synthetic? The fact they have a trap or the fact that they're? Many things. The, the fact that you have a trap, the, the, the scattering is infinity, right, so the particle. Scattering. Well, you, you, you have to do uh, similar like you do for, uh, for cone problems, right? That you have a very long range and here. For uh, three particles with infinite scattering, the potentials has attractive one of our squares. So you have to do the proper scattering with that. But of course, before we, we get to that point, you're exceeding the... the, the Another way to say uh, this, I mean, the, the Jose's work and our work has, has shown that when you that the main scattering, the recombination is occurring when distances are of the order of the scattering length. And so if you go to this situation, you have many particles inside that region where the three-body rate recombination rate is determined. And, and so it no longer really makes sense to think of three particles colliding if there were dozens inside of the region where they were colliding. Yeah. But uh, that would to me that's the what you need to drive is that equation for cases in a trap, right? Right, which is, I guess, what I was trying to kind of do. Yeah. But it's but not the fact that there's unitary. It's not the fact that It's not only the, the fact that it's unitary. That you're right, right? Uh, it's mainly the fact that there's always some particles in between. You never have a pure three-body process happening, right? So, yeah. Okay, yeah, I agree. Could we go back to quantifying? Sure. So I have a naive question. So this L3 dimension full quantity, so and we have three length scales in the problem. We have the density, the temperature, and the scattering length. Uh, so we can, of course... Uh, uh, the scattering length doesn't count in unitarity, right? You define unitarity as Na cube much larger than 1. So this okay. is the definition of your regime. So now. Of course, you can, since it's dimension full, you can, you know, write, take one length scale, let's say the temperature is before, and it should be like that, times a function of dimension less combination of the rest. And so from this perspective, I think the, the regional form with the temperature is very natural because the function would be of, of this combination, Na cube, so this is dimension less combination, and this is how you define the unitary. So this is meaning that it would be just a number. But if you switch now to the other language where you factor kind of one over n, so that you, 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 you write the loss as a, uh, some power of the density, then it should be a function of dimensionless combination of temperature and the scattering length, which might be different, right? Because it's, it's you uh, the look. definition of the unitary regime is really relies on an a cube much larger than one. So then I would naively guess that the original form makes kind of better, if you wish, because you... Well, it's not better because it does give you point microsecond, right? Point 0.4 microsecond. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm puzzled, so how... I, I would, my, my naive guess would be that if you define unitarity by Na cube much larger than 1, then it's kind of... So actually, yeah, the question is, in, in the calculation you did, what is the, uh, you know, temperature analog of 
So if you would make instead of n, you would take the Fermi, uh, uh, the, 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 the temperature lens, uh, density scale kind of what would be bigger, Na cube or, or the other combination with temperature? Well, the, the smallest rate you get is doing using the Fermi energy. So if in this regime, so yes, in the unitary regime, the good parameter for this scattering inertia is not the scattering rate, but the inverse of scattering rate. So when that condition satisfies, that means the one of A is essentially zero. It drops out of the problem. Yeah. No, no, no. It yeah. depends. If, if this condition is satisfied, it means either that one over a is zero, uh, so or oppositely, n is much larger, right? So it's uh -huh. it's a statement about two dimension, the ratio well, of two dimension for well, right. Mathematically, that's true. But uh, practically, when that condition is satisfied, we can essentially ignore any deviation from unitarity. We can simply assume a is infinite. Uh, the the correction is smaller. Is of order one over a. You would suggest that maybe we let just say continuous sure. uh -huh. events yeah, sort of lay out how we're treating the three body framework and then maybe in the afternoon we go back to all the sure. possible Yeah, and even because I think my experience in trying different ways of this problem, mm -hmm. you never really find a way that, that you can fully all you can pin down that's the right way to do it. And there's always some debate. And so what I was trying to do is just to find a way that we reduce uh, the n a few of these possibilities, right? And I was using this idea, right, that actually came from previous work, right, which is to use, uh, uh, to solve the problem, right, uh, in harmonic trap, but this, the, 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 this trap frequency, right, is determined by the local density. So if you have a high densities, you consider the problem in a tight harmonic trap. And if the, the density gets low, this trap, it's, it's actually uh, uh, wider, okay, it's weaker. And so basically the interaction of all the other atoms, right, are mimic through this. Um, basically, this would be a good Think if you, for very short times, right? When you do, when you jump at neutrality, and then the, 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 these three atoms that are inside uh, a certain volume, right? They will interact among themselves just for a short amount of time. Okay, that's the picture, and we relate the density to the amount uh, uh, the oscillator length this way, and the frequency to the density, and so on, and. So doing this, I'm solving the, 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 the three particles in a trap and imposing a quench. So I, start, I have an initial wave function right, with a small scattering, 150 bore, right, and I quench to unitarity. And now the total wave function is going to be a combination of all final states. You're, you are projecting your, your, your initial function to all possible three-body trap states. Right. And, of course, in our case, we have uh, our three body states, they have a finite width. And I'm going to get to that, right? Uh, I have a specific place where it's going to be easier to understand why they have a, a finite width. But in the end of the day, we can rederive or derive a formula for uh, effective recombination or effective loss rate. There's no recombination process, really. Scattering that depends on the population of a the final states and the corresponding width of each one of these states. Right? And once you do that, you the number we get, it is even better. Right? It's 0.1 millisecond. Right? But uh, I guess the, the one of the key things that come out from this kind of ideas is that we now, use, because I know that the width of the states, they depend linearly on the, 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 uh, this three-body parameter, in elasticity parameter, eta. <coughs> and uh, we, we were able to derive something that uh, tells us, would be uh, from where we could have idea, quantitative idea of the, how much the, the, the loss time scales are going to be larger. Then I'm calling tau C, but I should be calling tau MB, 
like in the beginning, right? It follows this thing. Like for Ruby 5, this ratio is about 31.5. In other species, they have different values of eta, right? You can already kind of anticipate what is going to be the ratio between losses and the many body time scales. Is that uh, in, in, in for this particular work, uh, that was the the time. Hmm? I think it's associated with the firm time. Uh, I think it's point four times h bar omega fermi. And, and also the, the trapping frequencies are much smaller than the. Uh, yeah. Nothing is moved. So this is a short time description. Okay. And Can you go back one step, please? Sure. I don't know why. To the, to the effective uh, free body recombination rate. Doesn't like to go back. Why so slow? It's not me, it's the, the, the computer. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have a question here. So you, 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 you said you determined the effective uh, harmonic frequency from the local density. Yes. And how, but then how you determine the local density? Thomas Fermi. Uh, That's in the initial BFC yeah. before you jump to your answer. Because yeah. uh, it is so such a short time. Uh, it's, very little, I see. Yeah. it's a short time but description. It's much shorter than the... Classical period of the harmonic yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. No worries. Blah, 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 blah. And then, okay, so it's still. So what is your conclusion? This is the best time scale, and this is what kind of covering. Well, from my perspective, right, I think that that's shown to be a, 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 a reasonable way to describe it gives uh, realistic time, uh, I mean, it agrees with the time scales in the problem, right? Of course, there are strong assumptions here, right? Uh, assuming these local uh, things, right? That you have this tighter trap that depend on the densities and so on, right? So the conclusion is that, I mean, the other one using the Fermi energy, right? It's just it's half of, a, I think it was 0.2 that I got. So, uh, I don't think the 0.6 that they see in experiments is a, is a solid number too, right? It's, so it's very loose. We are just trying to get order of magnitude right. But this can be done by doing this density instead of temperature, right? Yeah. That's what the yeah. Question. yeah. But that doesn't gi give you anything about, any information about FMOB states, right? This idea of using things in a trap, right, it allows us to, to actually look n this problem into more detail. Right, and that's what I want to show you. That's one work that I, I've been working for a while. Yeah, so I'm showing this in preparation for a t some time now. But uh, that shouldn't have happened. Anyway. You can Okay, no touching. Okay, this is the, the, the three body energy spectrum in a trap. Okay, for this particular trap, right, uh, well, l let me start this way. Right, when you have small and negative, you have oscillator states, which are the ones over here, and you, you have a positive scatter lens, these guys are uh, describing the, the weakly interacting three bi particle system, right? And then, of course, when you, you make the scattering large and negative, you, you can bind one FM of state. And in this case, for this trap, you can bind only one because the trap doesn't fit the second one, right? The, some of these states would go down if I, if I make the tra trap weaker, right? And in these states in a trap, I have introduced some finite width, right? Which essentially, when you have a deeply bound state, right? If you solve 
the, the two particle problem in an infinitely harmonic <laughs> trap, right? Of course, everything is going to be uh, bound state, uh, zero, zero width, and so on. But realistically, right, when you when you couple you, the, all these trap states that are associated with deeply bound state, they cannot remain trapped right, because the energy release it is much stronger than the trapping potential. So effectively, these levels they have to have a finite width, right? Because if I put uh, three particles in this level. It's going to leave there just for uh, some amount of time. And you may have said that. What is the ratio between your fundamentals links and the oscillator links? I mean, are these vertical lines? Um, do they indicate one? Um, let me see. So you want to know how much is this number? Yeah, in units of the fundamentals. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I, I, I can, uh, it's basically, because it can fit just one here. I would say it's about uh, maybe 30 times the, the, the Van der Waals length. The first f of state has about the size of four times the Van der Waals length. Roughly the same, all right. For the t for the densities they have in, in in the experiment, right? They actually the, the the second state would be barely bound. So it's like the, uh, it's even weaker than that. Right? The densities are not that high. Okay, so the the place the highest density in the trap, right? It can feed two f mob states. I mean. The second one is already struggling. Right. And so in this picture, right, if you now look at the quench, right, there we go. Right, this is the initial wave function. When you project, it's going to have probability to populate all these levels. Okay, those are schematic wave functions. Right. And uh, one other way to look again this problem is to look to, to the three body potentials right so uh, yeah this figure again is describing the same process right but with a bit more information right so you have this uh, you, you start with a no interacting system three particle system this repulsion here is the trap right so you have trap states you, you start from the lowest one and you have other states associated with these guys but they are lossy but the, li the lifetime of this state is very long. And then when you quench to unitarity, now you're going to populate uh, the two body states to, to at some level. But what we found is that for the lowest f mob state, that's essentially zero. You never populate because this state is much overlaps pretty badly with this one, with the initial state. Right? And good, because this state is the one that is very short-lived. Now the population of the second f of state for this particular density right, is about 20 percent. And the lifetime of this state is one millisecond. Okay? And then you can start up uh, populating, I mean uh, if you want to call this a f of state, right, but it's, it's a state that was already with positive energy but the wave function reassembled the, 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 the f of wave function is free space pretty well, but it has a large probability of populate this state and the lifetime for that particular state is one second. And if you populate other states which are associated with this out outer well, this part here, the lifetime for those states are extremely long, right? much larger than one second. Right? But the population of those ones is very small. Oops. How I calculate the, the decay? Um, uh, in, in different ways. Uh, there, there are different ways to do. One way is to actually uh, do the ver reverse problem. You start with a deeply bound dimer and a, a free particle, and then you do a scattering. And when you pass through the resonance, the sh phase shift is going to 
show a future because the resonance from this resonance you extract the width. That's going to give you the lifetime of that state. But there's some other ways that I found to do things more automatically and so on. And that's more a technical question I can answer for you later. Are they consistent with each other? Sure. Yeah, every way that I've found to calculate it with uh, was always consistent with the full numerical calculation. And I'm sorry, it's not me that is slow in, in switching the slides. It's maybe it's some parameter. Yeah. Okay, so I want to show you uh, a broader view of what is happening has a function of the density, okay? So essentially, if you have a very low density, right, and I calculate, it's gonna imply in a very loosely bound three-body trap, uh, ammonic trap. And I can, for very low density, I can bind three f mod states for a density of 10 to the eight centimeters per centimeters cube, and but as soon as the density starts increasing, what happens with these states? They start moving to the positive side, right? And they become trap states, right? And at the typical density in the experiments is 10 to the 12, which is exactly the verge when this, the second f mob state is, is, uh, is changing. It starts feeling the, the, the trap, right? But the lowest one, it changes very little. You cannot see the changes on this energy scale, right? And of course, I uh, was looking to the, 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 the population of these states after the quench, right? You see that very low density, there's a high uh, probability, the highest probability is the one for the, the, the third f mob state, and I reach some maximum and some particular density. And then after that density, the second one, when this guy becomes unbound, Right, the, 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 the population starts switching to, to the second one, to the lower one, and so on. And that's the lifetime of each one of these states as a function of the density. Okay? So for very low density, those are basically the free space lifetimes. Right? But of course, as you start to squeezing, right, you start increasing the probability, uh, because now you have the system in a finite volume, if you squeeze, that's going to increase the probability of find uh, particles at short distance overall. So the lifetime always decreases as you start to squeeze. Right? And more and more, you can keep the atoms at short distance. So that's a bunch of inf information. Right? I think it's. Uh, what is the density using the experiment? The peak density? Well, the, the, the experiment has. I, I did a few things, right? I could just look here at the, the average density, right, and, uh, and tell you some lifetime. Or I can actually integrate out this because this, the, the, in the system you have a Thomas Fermi distribution, so you, you can integrate out all of this. So in principle, all this is happening, of, well, the, their peak density is also about 10 to the 12. Right, so everything below 10 to the 12 could happen in principle inside a, in the gas. Okay, so that's why in the result, in the end, I integrate out everything. Right, but if you look here for the tip, oops, well, but if you look to the time uh, lifetime at average density already gives you a very good result. So actually integrating or not doesn't change much, the final answer. I, can, I could just look to the average density, but I have to do that bef uh, to see that happening, that you definitely can use just the average density. And of course, I was looking to, to the loss rate, right? Uh, after all, this has a function of the peak density now. And of course, you, you can see this n to the two thirds dependence, right? And what I found is this uh, is that the, the the loss rate also shows some sort of f f mod uh, signature, but now it comes with this universal uh, geometric scaling to the three thirds, 
right? If you do a dimensional analysis, that's what it should be, right? And uh, of course, that seeing this kind of uh, sign looking for this kind of signatures is, is basically uh, pretty hard. Right? You cannot change the density by five orders of magnitude easily, right? So it's really just to show that. It's still there, right? The FMO physics is still there. It, it does appear, and so on. What's gamma again? It's the loss rate. And well, the bottom line of this study, right? Kind of going back a little, summarizing, is that well, there is some separation of time scales, right? You have the the. The, the time scale for losses being larger than the, the time scale for many body physics that can allow people to explore many body physics at unitary gas. In, in the lifetime, in, the, in our analysis, really is controlled by the lifetime of the FMOV states. Right? Because most of the, 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 the population, when you do the quench, or goes to the excited FMOV states or some trapped states, and they all have lifetimes comparable to a one millisecond. Right? And I can quickly go to one thing, right, which I think is, is the question that has instigating me and Chris for some time, is whether or not we can control the lifetime of FMOB state, okay? You have some preliminary, preliminary results, I, and I think a good idea how to improve that. But I think that's... Um, there's a fundamental problem in this field, right, in the sense that field body physics is always lossy. Right? So we, if we don't find a way to, to control losses, right, you're not going to be able to observe field body physics affecting the many body other, in a different way than losses. Right? So we want to see interest, all the interesting physics we, we can we have to, to, to start learning how to control three-body losses. And for this unitary gas experiment, right, I, it's a, that's a good example. The, li the lifetime of the Bose gas is related with the lifetime of the FMO state, which is about a millisecond. But we can, the idea is to make it even lo larger than that, so they can ex study longer times and, and so on. But overall, for, for I think for the ultra cold gas community, improving losses would be a ben beneficial in every sense. Our initial idea was trying to use the what they call this blue shielding technique that was used uh, originally for two body par two particles, right? Which essentially is get getting two ground state atoms, apply a laser field which is blue detuning to a S to P transition, right? And when you are blue detuned, you're going to sample this part of the two body potentials, which is repulsive. It's one of the repulsive one of our cube. Right? And then, so when the atoms approach this distance where this, energy, this thing becomes resonant, resonant uh, the atoms are going to mix this attractive state with the repulsive one, and they would come back. So they never approach short distance. And we know that on the three-body problem, right, what is where the, the, the short distance is exactly where losses happen. So you want to prevent the atoms to get very close to each other. Uh, that was relatively successful for blue detune for, for two bodies. I mean, of course, that the time this this was more in, in context was. I don't think they have they, they improved. The scenario today is different. They can hopefully get a. Uh, that can be an even stronger too, right? And basically, yeah, those are the people that started. You can find this review too. And the idea is to, to do that on the three-body problem, right? Now, of course, we have to assume uh, uh, model interactions, right? For the S plus S interaction, the atom in the ground state, we are using Leonard Jones. And for S2P, we are using a pure repulsive one of our Q, right? And we are going to study the system already at A equals infinity. Is it other tropical repulsive? Yeah. 
um, the extension of for three bodies, right? It's, it might be a little. I don't want to get into details of the the scene. We don't have much time. That's not. A, that's really not impor important for now, since we have just a finite time. But the idea again is to apply a blue detuned laser. Of course, it's already affecting the two body and the three body. But what we found is that on the three body part, we also have repulsive one of our cube, right? And the coefficient is much larger than the coefficient for the two body, right? And that's, uh, that's a good sign. We still have to understand why that is happening. Right? So this is mostly preliminary stuff, right? But the idea, again, is to, to use the same principle. If I now show what a, we call the dressed potentials, that is the potential that includes effects of the field, right? you see this guy is, is the FMOV potential. You have schematic things for, for the, th these levels here are not real energies, right? There's just schematics. And, and that's the lossy channel. And of course, you could, you have to shift this one of our cube interaction by one photon. That's what it is, right? And that's the detuning in this dressed picture. So essentially, what you would be doing is coming in this channel, right? And then when you see something like this, you're gonna prevent at some point because the, the width of this avoid cross depends on the Rabi frequency. Right? You can, the idea is try to prevent the atoms to approach very short distances. And that's how you see that happening through this, this barrier. Uh, just are, are those are all avoided crossings? Uh, yes, but those ones are very narrow. The only one that is really important is this one. So that introduced in the problem, these two parameters, right, to try to control the, li the, the losses, right, with the driver frequency and the, the, the tuning, right. But we have to, to, to find the optimal detuning. It, it, that's requiring a little bit of experimentation to find, because this is a, a quantitative question, right. So to quantify then the effect of shielding, what we were doing is just looking to the width of the states has we changed the, the tuning and has we changed the Rabi frequency, okay? Now, the way that we actually look the lifetime of the state is by doing uh, a scattering from the bottom above. So the phase, when I do this calculation, this is, yeah, uh, actually not from here, but uh, way down here, right? The, so I start with uh, this channel and then I scan the energy, and when I scan the energy, the phase shift is gonna show features when you pass through the resonances. And from that feature, why do you extract the width? That's how you do. So I'm gonna show you some results for uh, the phase shift. And the maximum value is, uh, the, the position where you find the maximum is the energy of the state, and the height is related with the inverse of the, well, the height is uh, so proportional to the lifetime. So, we started, uh, come on, okay. Okay, this is for zero field, okay? So if I scan the energy, I see a feature like that, all right? From that feature, I extract the energy of the, the state, which is this much, and that's the lifetime, okay? And the, the tuning for this, it's 20 line, line width, which is this much of a thing. You know, I, I'm doing it in units on line width, but imagine this is just a, a, a detuning from the, the resonance. And when I turn on the field, what I see is that the energy changes and the lifetime gets smaller. Right? That's probably because we, what we are doing, we are leaking things out of this channel. Right? So for this particular detuning, we are making the lifetime shorter. But finding uh, another detuning, if I do the same analysis, I get an improvement on the lifetime, but it's, it's small, it's still small. It's about 20% of improvement, right? And 20% of improvement in a few microseconds is not much, right? So that's where we are, right? We, we 
In principle, we can see uh, that we can control the energy of the state, which means be controlling the three-body parameter itself, right? improve the, the lifetime just for a little bit. Right. But we also re realize that we are doing this for the lowest FMOV state, so that's the hardest one to do it. Right. For the excited state, this shield might be working much better. Right. But took us, a, or took me, I don't want to throw that responsibility to Chris, took me some time to realize that. Um, anyway, that's the summary, and I hope you guys have fun. Thanks. Just one question, and other questions can be asked to the end. Mm -hmm. So when you calculate the lifetime of the three-body system, um, is that an agreement, or is that different in some way from the calculations that ran at a standard? I mean, of course, you have the quention there, which gives you the population probability. Mm -hmm. But the lifetimes themselves, Which result are you talking about? Agree with what? That they have a, a formula, right? There is a formula that uh, they say the lifetime is basically, I forgot exactly the numbers, or the width of the state is proportional to eta and the energy of the trimer. Is that what you're talking about? It, it, it is. Th there's some uh, uh, probably exponential of pi over s naught somewhere and so on. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They do. Of course, that they do when the phys the the phys the the three three d the untrapped the, when the states are not feeling the trap. Okay, yeah. But when they don't agree, I, I think that I can explain why, and I think it shouldn't agree anyway. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank you, Jose, again. Thank you.